I think one of the coolest ways of learning is just being asked a question and then you having to try to come up with the answer. And sometimes when you're asked a question, you realize you don't have the answer and you're like, oh, that's a area I should probably learn more about, right? It's like when a little kid asks you, why is the sky blue? And you have to be like, uh, I think it's because the sun like hits the ocean and then that like reflects up into the clouds. I'm not really sure though. And then you realize I should probably research that and find out why the sky is blue, right? So first question I have for you, uh, we're, we're gonna start out by answering, I'm gonna ask you six, six questions, six basic questions that we're gonna brainstorm together the answers to. And for a lot of these questions, there may be multiple answers. So don't feel like there's like one right answer, but I would like each of you to contribute some form of an answer. Cool? All right, cool. First question is what is money? And feel free to unmute and we'll, we'll type in the answers together. What is money? It's a vessel of value. It's a translation system of value. Cool, okay. It's a transfer of energy. Transport? Transfer of energy. Transfer, Transfer of energy. Okay. What else is I was going to say the same thing. That it's energy and um, you can get things with it. It creates like opportunities. Get it can help you create things. Get things with it being like that means it would make it like a um like a, a a purchasing tool. Yeah. Or yeah, purchasing tool and you can create anything you want with it. Create anything I want with it. So it's like a create a create a creationary tool. That's the word. Yeah. Okay, cool. I'll add on to that uh, source of power, right? So that goes along the lines of creation of your tool, but yeah, that's good. Yeah, well, I heard a really cool definition of it today, which was it's liquid, liquid power. Being like it can, it can be, it can morph into different shapes, and it can act as power in different forms. So okay. Uh, another another way I like to look at money too. You guys have mentioned a lot of good good ones here. I like these. Another one is um, it, it's a store. I know you said like a translation system of value, transfer of energy. I also see it as a store of energy. Like you put ten hours into working a nine to five job. Let's say you get paid ten hours. Ten. Let's say you get paid ten dollars an hour. You put ten hours of work in. You can now store that work into this hundred dollars bill, right? You're storing that energy for later use. I also see it as a store of value. So he says the translation system value, definitely. I also see it as a store of value, meaning I could take the $100 today and spend that $100 a week from now, right? Yeah, but even talking about $100, I mean, back in the days, you would, I mean, kill a goat. And then you didn't need goat for 10 days. You needed some goat and some cow and some other things. <laughs> so you had to like, to find all the people who had what you wanted to trade. So it's like, a, it, it was the trade um, transition um, tool for trading. So it's like a way of weighing how yeah. much is order of a goat compared to half a cow. Yeah. Yeah, trading tool for sure. Yeah, I see it. another another way of looking at it is like is like money is like a bridge between supply and demand. Yeah, exactly. Right, bridge between supply, which is your goat, and demand, which is my hunger. Let's say right, money is going to be that bridge. So cool. All right, so we got a general idea here of what money is uh, nowadays. The main type of money we all use, because based on this, by the way, based on our definitions here, by the way, this does not say anything about paper or doesn't say anything about uh, credit cards, right? We all agree that like it's more than just paper and credit cards and numbers on a screen, right? So based on this definition, various things can be used as money, right? Like gold bars or gold coins or silver, right? 
or like um, I'm in Dubai. We have different money here in Dubai. We have like plastic money in Dubai, not even paper, plastic, right? So this would still be considered money based on our definitions here. Vessel of value, it's a creationary tool, source of power for sure. I can buy stuff with it, store of energy, cool. So it doesn't necessarily need to be one of these things, which a lot of Americans here are probably very familiar with. <laughs> So, I don't I don't really see the difference, <laughs> but sorry. Yeah, this I can rip in half. It's an American paper bill. It's like monopoly money. Like it rips really easily. Like I just, yeah. I just ripped it. But it it's not more worth than plastic money. I mean, if you compare the paper to the plastic, none of it has real like well value in itself. No, it's it's, the, no, the no tape. money doesn't. It it has it has this value right here, which is yeah which is just what we said. It's like, it's a trading tool. It's what we agreed. It's an agreed, uh, I should say, an agreed upon trading tool. Agreed upon. Because if we don't agree on it, then it's not going to trade well, right? Okay. As we can see, money is a lot of things, but it's not necessarily just some piece of paper or this. It can be gold. It can be, as you said, cows. It can be salt. Back in the day, they used salt as money, right? And they used shells as money, seashells. So... Today, though, when we think of money, we think of fiat currency, which is government-backed money, right? So question for you guys now is why does fiat money, the money that we use, lose purchasing power over time? This is the question. Why does fiat currency lose its purchasing power over time? As an example, you can see... That in 1928, for example, you could buy this much stuff with 20 bucks. In 1996, you could buy this much stuff. 2017, you can buy this much stuff. And this is no joke. You go to Whole Foods, you buy like a bag of lettuce, romaine lettuce, it's like 10 bucks. And then you buy a bag of like organic frozen peas, it's like another 10 bucks. There's your 20 bucks, right? Boom. So why is it that this happens with money? That's the question. Why does fiat money lose purchasing power over time? Does anyone have the answer to this? Because they print more and more of it. There's no cap on how much exists. Okay. But it's also got to do with the with the um, the. I'm not a native English speaker. The calculation of of growth. So you you will have increased growth. You will have the 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 trading tool value. It's just it's not just a number. So it doesn't it doesn't mean anything. If I go to Japan and it says yen or Italian lira in the old days, there was just a lot of zeros on the money. So it doesn't mean anything. Which yeah, it's why just does it, why did it lose power over time? That's the question. So, due to the increased wealth and growth, the deflation that yeah. comes with that. Inflation. Inflation, yeah. So it deflates the money value. Yeah, I the, guess I would. the inflation yeah. of the currency deflates the purchasing yeah. power. Yeah. Yeah. So I remember when I played, I played, I grew up playing this computer game called RuneScape. And in RuneScape, it was like this multiplayer game with millions of users all around the world. You could log in and you play with different people. And there was different swords that you could get and different like hats that you could get. And one time on Christmas, the game developers decided to release these things called uh, Santa hats. RuneScape Santa hats. And the first time they released these Santa hats, they only released about like a thousand of these Santa hats. And so people from around the world were like, wow, these Santa hats are so rare. Well, whoops. These Santa hats are so rare that they're we're going to only sell them for like a million GP, a million gold coins. And so they were worth a lot. Well, then the next Christmas came, and what did the game developers do next? They released even more Santa hats. So what ended up happening to the value of the Santa hats? The value of the Santa hats went way down because the amount of them went way up. 
Now there's way more Santa hats. They're everywhere. Everyone's got Santa hats now. So they lose their allure. They lose their, 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 their they lose the scarcity, right? So it loses scarcity. That's another way of saying it. Right. So again, we don't. You don't need to be a rocket science to figure this. A rocket scientist to figure this out. You just need to think about it. These are like fundamentals. It works in a computer game. It works in real life. If I, if you're really thirsty right now, and we're we're at a rock concert. We're partying at a rock concert, and we're thirsty. And someone comes along with some uh, some water, and there's only like a couple of bottles of water. How much are you willing to pay for that little bottle of water? Probably like ten, twenty bucks, right? You're thirsty, you're at a rock concert, there's thousands of people, there's only a few bottles of water. How much are you willing to pay for it? 10, 20 bucks, I bet. Okay, yeah. But if then comes along trucks and trucks and trucks of water bottles, now all of a sudden the value of that, even the perceived value of it goes way down. You're like, oh, there's thousands of bottles, I should be able to get one for a couple bucks, tops. So, more equals less worth. So again, don't you be smart to figure it out. You seem to think about it. So the next question is, why do people invest in gold? Give me some answers here. It's because it's it's a limited batch somehow. So it was originally it was used to to keep like that people could just not make money. They needed some kind of fi finite. Amount finite, finite, yeah, it's finite. It's a limited batch, as you said. So, why else do people invest in gold? Like, well, what's the reason? Not, not why is gold um, valuable, but like, why do people invest in it? What, what are they hoping to get from investing in it? So, it's, it's a vehicle of investment, so it, it holds the value of it holds value in the way. Fiat currency does not. Gold holds value in a way that fiat does not. Explain. So just kind of like uh, Cornell um, mentioned that it, it's scarce, right? It's, uh, it's a scarce commodity, whereas paper can be printed infinitely. Gold is something that eventually is going to run out on the planet. So therefore, that that alone makes it hold its value, is that right? Yeah. Just the fact that it's right. I think another another thing to consider too is the reason people invest in gold is because other people invest in gold. Mm. It, it, dude, it's agreed upon. Yep, yeah, exactly. If you were the only person to invest in gold, it wouldn't be worth much because nobody would care. But because other people do, now it's got some actual value there, right? Uh, probably another reason people invest in gold is uh, not only is it limited batch, it's finite, it's, um, it's difficult to find slash produce. If it was really easy to get gold, you know, there wouldn't be much value. It's difficult. It's also shiny. That probably helps as well. <laughs> sure. sure no, but it, it's true that it's like jewelry. It's, yeah. it's a good material for making jewelry, so you can wear it when you when you um, nomad, you know. So yeah. so people could bring the money like jewelry from yeah. place to place. Sure. So pearls and stuff was also a value mm -hmm. system once. So people invest, and then the, but the reason they're investing in gold, as is as Sati said, is. It holds value in a way fiat does not. And ideally, it's as opposed to fiat currency, which is inflationary, gold is deflationary. Good. Meaning the price of an ounce goes up over time. Meaning if you have $100 in fiat currency over time, as we see, the purchasing power goes down, down, down. But with gold, ideally, this is why people invest in it, is the purchasing power goes up and up and up, right? So it increases purchasing power over time. 
as opposed to decreasing. It increases in purchasing power over time. So again, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to figure to figure this out. You just need to think about it. Oh yeah, this makes sense. This is why people invest in gold. They want these things from it. And these are some of the properties of gold. Sure, it's finite, limited batch, difficult to produce. Yeah. Other people do it. These, these are fundamentals. If, if, if none of these were true or if some of these were not true, gold would lose its allure. People would not be investing in it like they're investing in it. So next question, though, is what gives gold its worth? And we, we touched on this a few, a few things already. It's finite. Um, it's hard to produce. Other people want it. Um, I think some kind of tradition also, because some of the metals that are needed for electronics now should be even more um, it difficult has, to work. It has uh, use cases. Yeah, it's like, and it's cross-cultural and it's like- Yeah, 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 yeah. it's cross, cross-cultural, it's global. It's got a global, global desire, right? People want it around the world. Is it not true the Americans have gold in Fort Knox still or something like that? Yeah, America. It's like America has like the highest store of gold. Yeah. Yeah, as like a a sensor for the whole state and money system. Hmm. It used to be. Yeah. Well, people. America at one point demanded that all their citizens give the gold to the government because they said, "Hey, we're going to war. We need your gold." <laughs> So they demanded all the citizens give them the gold. Clever. <laughs> and they then they collected all this gold, and then it was just a few years later that they said, "Hey, the money that we have, we're going off the gold standard." And now they don't have it anymore. So cool. That's what gives gold its worth, right? And if, if it wasn't finite, if it wasn't hard to produce, if other people didn't want it, if it didn't have use cases, if it wasn't used globally, it wouldn't be worth what it's worth today. That's it. That's what we're looking at. These are the properties that make gold valuable. You can't say this, by the way, this, this list right here, you can't say this about almost anything else on the planet. You know, you can say it to an extent about silver, but silver is like, it's probably more silver out there. It's a bit easier to produce. Less people want silver. It has less use cases. You know, there's less desire for it. Gold is just like at the top when it comes to like the physical goods, right? This list is very gold specific. You can't, the properties do not apply to almost any other commodity or asset out there that I'm aware of in the physical space. So that's very interesting to observe. One last thing. Yeah. One last thing that divides it from like diamonds is that it can change its form to be fluid and then be put into special shapes and weight, weight yeah, uh, the amounts. Divisible. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. Divisible. The fact that it's divisible, amazing trait, amazing characteristic that gives gold another um, plus point for sure. Cool. So mm. now the next question is you right now personally, would you rather if you have a, let's say you have $100,000, do you want to store $100,000 in the bank right now over the next 10 years? Or would you rather store the hundred thousand dollars in gold over the next ten years? Real estate, anytime. I'm an architect. <laughs> if you have the choice between putting it in the bank or putting it into gold, where would you put? It? Where would you put it? Gold. I would never put money in the bank. You'd never put money in the bank. Kelly says gold. Yeah. So pretty obvious answer is gold, okay? So we've just, we just like broke down the fundamental characteristics of gold. We talked about why fiat like loses its purchasing power every year. Uh, why is it, is it, it actually loses approximately 7% every year. 
which is incredible, which means if you have 100 grand in the bank and it loses 7% a year, how much is that 100 grand worth over the next 10 years? Like purchasing power wise? It's worth 30 grand. This went from 100 grand down to 30 grand. And you can look, I'm like, you can go on Google and look at the inflation charts to see the purchasing power, how it's gone down, 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 down over the years. It's incredible. Um, cool. And gold, you can see the opposite. It's gone up and up and up and up. So that's that. Now, the final question is, this is a fun one. Let's talk about the downsides. What are the downsides of gold? Because we know gold is epic, right? We just talked about why it's epic, what gives it its worth. You can wear it. You, in fact, you just said you'd rather invest in gold than just keep the money as money in, in fiat currency, I should say. But what are the downsides of gold? It's not liquid, so I can't go to the grocery store and pay with gold. Hard to use in everyday scenarios. What else? It's hard to store because, I mean, if you're like on the go or traveling or whatever, it's hard to just carry a bunch of gold with you. Hard to store safely. Hard to travel with. Um, well, uh, Sati said also a point. It's like it's, it's, it's hard to divide easily. You can divide. It's very hard. Yeah, it's divisible, but it's not easy to divide. Um, if you're going to store it safely, it's expensive. Uh, easy to confiscate. confiscate. Please come to your house. Give us your gold. Government makes it mandated. Hey, give us your gold. We're going to World War III. We need your gold. If you don't give us your gold and we find you with gold, you're going to jail for 20 years. Give us your gold. They've done it before. World War One, I, I believe it was. Might have been World War Two. They can do it again. Easy conversation. Oh, dude, try traveling the world like I travel with a bunch of gold. Try to take a try to take ten thousand dollars, let alone a hundred thousand dollars, let alone a million dollars with the gold through the airport. You think they're gonna let you travel through the airport with a hundred grand worth of gold? No chance. You're taking that. Uh, easy to confiscate. Um, easy to be robbed. Easy to lose. You can lose that. Shit, where did I put it? I thought I buried it under that tree. Maybe it was that tree. Oh no, maybe it was that tree. Crap, maybe it was the rock. Forget it. It's lost now. I think it's hard to find for like the average person. Like I wouldn't even really know where to start to find quality gold. Quality. Hard to know the quality. Hard to, you, you can find gold pretty easy. You just don't know if it's good gold. You just go on the internet and type how to, how to buy gold in California. It'll pop up. But how do you know if it's good? Um, pain in the ass to buy and sell. I bought and sold a lot of gold in my day. I am now officially out of that market. Such a pain in the ass every time I tried to buy and sell. You got to make, yes, the store has to be open. You got to wait in line. You got to give them your identity. You have to uh, pretty much fill a bun bunch of paperwork for it. Then you got to look behind your shoulder when you walk out of the store with it because everyone's looking at you. You got a big bag of gold. It's such a pain in the ass to buy and sell. And it's super sketchy if you try to buy and sell it with someone like on the street. And if you buy and sell it, there's fees, high fees associated with buying and selling at a, you know, at a, um, at a, let's just say at a store, an exchange. I, the fees are silly. You not get like if gold is worth let's say three thousand dollars an ounce and you're gonna go sell it, you won't get three thousand dollars an ounce for it. You'll you'll get maybe twenty eight hundred dollars or something. Like they take two hundred buck fee. It's crazy. So stupid. 
These are the downsides of gold. And these are unfortunately unavoidable just based on the properties of gold and it being physical. So for as amazing as we say it is, as much as we would rather invest in gold than keep our money in fiat, the downsides are real. In fact, Sati and Kelly right now, I could probably, or I wouldn't do this, but I probably could, trick you into thinking that this bar right here is actual gold. It weighs like gold, it looks like gold, it feels like gold, but really it's just lead painted with some gold coating. You know, and this is what they used to do. They used to have lead bars painted with gold. And the only way you could tell it was actual gold was by the sound of it, which is why they call it sound money. You heard that phrase before, sound money? Yeah. It's cool that you mentioned that. I remember they read something about Christopher Columbus when he came to North America. He came across fool's gold. And it looked like gold. It, everything along the sides, it, it was a you know description of gold. But and when they brought it back to Europe, it was not gold. And he was... He was really laughed at and made a fool of. Dude, and that's that's not cool if you want something to be like the best store of value out there. And, and that, that's what we said money is, right? We want money to be these things, right? So if we want money to be these things, this what I'm about to say is is very important. If we want money to be these things, Without these issues, we can't use gold, right? If we want money to be these things, but we don't want these things, then we can't use gold. And that's kind of unfortunate because most people think that gold is the answer. Let's just put it all into gold. And, you know, there's other places you could put money, like real estate, et cetera. But real estate also comes with a ton of downsides, which we won't get into right now. But point is, these have, uh, gold has major downsides. And so the question now is, okay, well, what's, what's the alternative? And this, ladies and gentlemen, is where we get into Bitcoin. Bitcoin 101. How and why the future belongs to those who hold Bitcoin. So what we're about to dive into here is an introduction to Bitcoin. I'll walk you through briefly my introduction to it, um, how and why I'm so bullish on it. Why, as we speak, I'm selling my Tesla and I'm taking all the money from my Tesla. It's going to be approximately like 60 grand or something. Taking all the money from the Tesla and putting it into Bitcoin, more Bitcoin. I'm going all into Bitcoin. I've sold everything I own in Canada, I've taken all the money from that stuff, put it into Bitcoin. Every time I sell a program online, I take the profits, put it into Bitcoin. Pay my team, put the rest in Bitcoin. I have a credit card that I buy stuff with and it pulls money from my Bitcoin wallet. So even the credit card I'm using uses Bitcoin. I live off Bitcoin right now. I've been doing that for the past couple of months. So... We will get into this uh, right now. But before we do, does anyone have any questions based on that introduction that we just did? Happy to take a quick pause here and jump into any questions anyone has. Well, a lot more people showed up. Wow. There was like five of us at the beginning. Now there's 14. Cool. Yeah, so you kind of mentioned like, obviously people kind of go into like real estate and even like rental properties, this and that. Like, uh, what are your thoughts on if you do have those assets at this point? And uh, yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. We'll, we'll we'll talk about that as we get through this. But I love no headaches. I love no stress. I love not taking up no pun intended. Mental real estate. I like my mental real estate to be pretty, pretty scarce. I don't want to have a bunch of mental real estate being used up. And I've. I currently own some property in Canada. I'm trying to sell it right now as we speak as well. I don't want to deal with that, dude. I, I have to deal with like maintenance. I got to deal with the neighbors. I got to deal with the, uh, the local laws changing, the taxes, uh, shit breaking down. If there's like, if somebody gets hurt on my property, now I got to deal with that. It's so much to deal with, bro. For what? 
for like for marginal gains, I'd rather make those marginal gains on or much more than marginal gains on crypto or by business. You know, not holding some real estate. Real estate is just like such a uh, takes up a lot of mental real estate. So, but I was born, but my parents, dude, and your parents were born in the generation where like real estate was how you made the money. So a lot of them have made really good money with real estate. And so in their mind, there's a really good book, by the way, it's called The Psychology of Money. Highly recommend it, The Psychology of Money. And it talks about how if someone from a different generation has made money with something, then even in the new generation, if there's a better vehicle for making money, it's hard for them to see that. It's hard for them to let go of the old generation because they've already made money with this old way. So my uncle, for example, he's still all in about gold and silver. He tells me every day, buy more gold and silver because he made money with gold and silver. He doesn't realize that that's, that's done. Uh, my, my parents, they're like, Dad, you should buy real estate. You should buy real estate because they bought real estate for 30 grand. It's now worth over a million dollars. So in their mind, they're like, Ted, you're crazy for not buying real estate. And I'm like, you bought it for 30 grand. I'm not dropping a mill on that thing. That's a, that boat's come and gone. I'm in the crypto wave now. You know, so um, the psychology of money, very, very good book. But to answer your question about real estate, I just don't want to deal with shit, man. Bitcoin, I can pack it up in my head. I, you can store your Bitcoin in your head. You can store the, you can store the password in your head. I can go to Turkey, I can go to Iceland, I can go to Venezuela, I can go to Panama, I'm going to Mexico tomorrow. I'm in Dubai right now. Bitcoin comes with me right here. It's digital. Can I ask? Digital property, it's weightless. It comes with me everywhere. Yeah, go for it. For now. First time I heard about Bitcoin, I mean like real, where I was among people who talked that they had Bitcoin. That was in 16. So it's seven years, like you said. Uh, that you've been, uh, I mean, uh, to me, I mean, I'm almost 60. So to me, it's like just yesterday it was invented. So there was nothing else but real estate and gold in my life. Yeah. So I'm like still getting used to credit cards of plastic. <laughs> yeah. And we're going to talk about that tech, tech, technological adoption takes time. Uh, for you, the internet still might be kind of weird. Yeah, yeah. I didn't have it to begin with. <laughs> Yeah, so, so, so for yeah. you, exactly. So the fact but, that you're on the workshop, by the way, kudos for being on this workshop. That's amazing. Uh, most people your age, my mom included, will be like, Ted's doing a Zoom call? I don't know how to do Zoom. I'm not going. No, no. <laughs> you're like, oh, let me figure it out. It's like, how do I find the link? You know? So, yeah, I, I get it. Um, and, and so the just the fact, can we take a moment to appreciate that the internet is so new? Humans have been around for like, I don't know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. We've never had the internet before. And as of, check this out, as of 40 years ago, you couldn't get a message from Canada to India like that. How do you get a message from Canada to India 40 years ago? You know? 50 years ago, 60 years ago. We called it airborne mail. Recorded airborne mail. You write a letter with the freaking, with the typewriter stamp or, the or stamp and send it and hope it gets there, right? My grandma still sends me letters in the mail. Happy birthday, Ted. Merry Christmas, Ted. I get a letter in the mail with like a little thing on it. And it's just like, it's not even a big letter either. She'll like send me a letter in the mail with like a sentence saying, happy birthday, Ted. Love you, you know? I don't even know how to send a letter anymore. But point is, the internet is brand new. Humans are still trying to understand how to use the internet. Every one of you here is trying to start a business online because it's so foreign. Uh, but if your kids are raised on the internet, to them, it's the most obvious thing in the world. In fact, I, I'm friends with a couple uh, younger kids. One's like 15, one's 18. They are so fast on the internet, they're faster than me. And I was raised on the internet, but I didn't start till I was like, seven or eight. These kids started when they were like two. So they're much faster than me at the internet. And so Bitcoin, the reason I'm saying this is because Bitcoin is just another layer on top of the internet. And as fast as the internet was adopted, Bitcoin is now being adopted even faster. So Bitcoin has a faster adoption rate, globally speaking, than the internet had. 
That's pretty profound. Because think about this. For you to find out about the internet, you couldn't use the internet to find out about it. We all found out about the internet offline. Isn't that fascinating? There was a time where we were offline, not plugged in, didn't even know you could plug in. And someone told us, hey, there's this thing, the internet. And we're like, oh, really? It was like a foreign concept to us in our lifetime. Now with things like Bitcoin, it's a layer on top of the internet. And so with the press of a button, like me sending out this email today about the workshop, thousands of people can now find out about Bitcoin every single day. And millions of people are joining the Bitcoin network every single year because of this. It's got a crazy fast adoption rate. So give it another 10, 20 years. Oh my God, it's going to be nuts to see where it's at right now. In fact, as I'll show you in just a sec, Bitcoin is, is the fastest, not only the fastest adoption rate of any new technology, but it's also the fastest asset class to reach a trillion dollars um, compared to other things like stocks and, and whatnot. Let me, let me try and find you that picture here. Um, Right here, look at this. The time it took assets to reach a trillion dollar market cap. It took Microsoft 44 years to reach a trillion dollars in investors. Apple took 42 years. Amazon took 24 years. Google took 21 years. Bitcoin took 12 years. In 12 years, Bitcoin is already at a trillion dollars in investor money. It's growing very, very quickly. Cool, so let's get into this. Lots to cover. I'm not sure how much we'll cover today. Hopefully we'll cover a lot, but I'll send you all this document after if you want to read in deeper uh, once we're done. So I first heard about Bitcoin through my sister many, many years ago. She bought some for 500 each and I thought she was an idiot. In fact, I told her she was an idiot. I got really angry at her because I was like, you're wasting, for some reason, I thought she was wasting like my money too. So it was like family money. It's like, you're wasting our money on that. What an idiot. You got, you got scammed. And then the price was going up and up and up. And I secretly, without her knowing, started to do some research on what exactly it was and how it worked. So here I was judging her without even knowing what it was. How classic is that, right? And as I became more and more convinced that it actually wasn't a scam, I ended up getting some. I wanted to get some myself. And then through the law of attraction, some dude reached out to me. He's like, hey, can I pay you in Bitcoin for my, your coaching? I said, sure. So he sent me some Bitcoin. And once he paid me, I realized how easy it was to use and accept and the, the thing that attracted me was that this was completely underground. The government was not aware that I was being paid. And to me, I was like, that's amazing. I don't need to pay taxes on this. Some dude just sent me some Bitcoin and it's completely under the radar. That was very attractive to me. So I'm like, I want to buy some myself now. So I bought some myself, hoping that it would go up in price. And when I finally bought some, the price was $1,200 per coin, which is more than double than what my sister paid. So I was the one now feeling like an idiot for having let it double on me. Uh, I was hoping it would 10x and I could turn my $1,200 into 12 grand. Now, Bitcoin is worth nearly $28,000 per coin. In fact, you can find out what it is right now. I go to the website every day, coinmarketcap.com. It's just about to hit 28 grand. Over the past seven days, it's up three and a half or 3.3%, whatever. So that's where we're at now. As a disclaimer, by the way, before we get into this even further, none of what I'm saying is financial advice. I won't, I can't stress that enough. This is not financial advice by any means. This is just my thoughts and perspectives on Bitcoin. Um, but getting some Bitcoin now might turn you into a millionaire. Is it guaranteed? Of course not. Is it possible? Sure is. How? Because when you buy Bitcoin and the price of it goes up, you become richer. If the price goes up high enough, you can eventually become a millionaire. I personally predict, and it's not just my predictions, by the prediction of many, many other Bitcoiners, by the year 2035, the price of Bitcoin will be at least $1 million per coin. Meaning if you were to drop, say, 28 grand today on a Bitcoin, not saying you should, but if you did, I would say that within the next 10 years, the price will be at a million bucks and you'll be a millionaire. But to make sure you get Bitcoin at the best price and to make sure you store it securely, you need to understand how it works. So this guide is going to help you do just that. Over the next few minutes, we're going to be exploring four very important questions when it comes to Bitcoin. Number one, what exactly is it? What are the benefits of holding it? Will the price of Bitcoin keep going up? And how can I get started with Bitcoin? Because once you have the answer to these four questions, you'll know what you need to do to become a Bitcoin millionaire. So first things first, what is Bitcoin? I had fun writing this and doing a lot of research on it to give you like the best answer I possibly could, but this is the answer I came up with. 
Bitcoin is the world's first decentralized online payment network that lets people instantly send and receive wealth globally, peer to peer with minimal fees. Let's break that down one word at a time so you can truly make sense of it. World's first, meaning no technology before Bitcoin ever made it possible for humans to send and receive real world wealth person to person without a middleman. It's the first ever technology. So price aside, I know we're talking about price and the price going up and you becoming a million or whatever, but price aside, Bitcoin is the first ever technology that lets you send and receive a file online that's not replicatable. So if I send you a picture right now, yes or no, can you make a copy of that picture? If I send you an email right now, it's a digital file. Can you make a copy of that email? Yeah. So you can make copies of any file on the internet except Bitcoin. Bitcoin's the first technology that's allowed you to send something and receive something that cannot be made a copy of, which works really cool as money, right? Because if something was copyable, it wouldn't work as money. You send me a dollar, but then you make a copy of that dollar, it doesn't really work. Bitcoin's like, you send me the dollar and now you don't have the dollar. So this bottle goes to this hand and now this hand doesn't have it anymore. Bitcoin's the first ever technology that lets you do that. Digitally. Because get, like this is, when I first found out about this, it blew my mind. I'm like, wow, for the first, because I grew up sending screenshots and going right click file copy my whole life. I make copies of everything. Google Docs. First thing I do when someone sends me a Google Doc, file, make copy. Bitcoin, you can't make a copy of it. it once you send it, it's, you don't have it anymore. It's not yours. It's the person you sent it to. So that's the first thing about Bitcoin. It's the world's first. Next is decentralized, meaning it's not owned by any single person, entity, or company. As such, it can't be shut down. It can't be stopped. It's an open protocol. Anyone can use 24-7, 365. Bitcoin is owned by everyone who uses it. That's really powerful. Other this. Every other cryptocurrency out there can be shut down. It's owned by a company. It's owned by an organization. It can be manipulated. Bitcoin, there's no single entity company behind it. Online payment network. Well, just like highways and roads allows cars to travel from place to place, Bitcoin allows monetary value to travel from place to place. So that means we can now send and receive monetary value over the internet, which can then be turned back into local currency anytime if need be. And globally, that's pretty obvious, from anywhere in the world to anywhere in the world, P2P, meaning person to person with no middleman. So many people think that email is P2P, but it's not because Gmail or whatever email server you're using actually collects the data, holds on the servers, it's not P2P at all. Google is the middleman in that case. But P2P means like if I give, if I give Kareen some cash right now, that's P2P. If Kelly gives me a dollar right now. If I fly over to California, she gives me a dollar, that's P2P. If she gives me a sip of her mango coconut smoothie, that's P2P. There's no middleman between us. Bitcoin allows us to send one another monetary value that's between us. No government, no company. It's between us. How cool is that? It's like cash, digital cash. And with minimal fees. So we'll talk about why fees exist in a sec, but compared to bank fees, PayPal fees, Western Union fees, Bitcoin transaction fees are extremely low. They usually just cost a few pennies per transaction. Someone can send a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin, it would cost them two bucks. If you tried to do that with the bank, that would cost like 20 grand or more. So in summary, Bitcoin is the first ever global currency and store value for every human being on earth. Another way of looking at the question of what is Bitcoin is just to compare it to gold. It's often considered digital gold because it resembles gold and that it acts as a store of value. It's hard to produce and it's ultimately very scarce. It's truly scarce. It's truly scarce. It's finite. Gold, we don't know how much gold there's going to be on the planet. We could keep, in fact, an asteroid could fly through the universe right now and hit our earth and we could get a bunch more gold. We don't know how much gold there is. Bitcoin, we know exactly how many, gold, how many Bitcoins are going to be produced.
21 million maximum. Uh, let's just quickly talk about the fees of Bitcoin because you might be saying, Ted, if there's no middleman, why are there fees? Well, the reason Bitcoin works is because if I send Kareen a Bitcoin right now, for example, to make sure that I'm actually sending her a genuine Bitcoin, it's not a fake, to make sure that it's not like a, just a file that I copied and I'm sending her a duplicate, there are some what we call miners in, in between who verify the transactions. And so for that transaction to be verified as legitimate, it requires some computing power. So some people from around the world are mining Bitcoin, aka verifying transactions. And because their computers cost money to maintain and to buy and the energy they're using from the wall outlet, right? Like this, me using energy right now, this costs money. This is not free. And so it requires real world energy to verify a transaction on Bitcoin. And so we need to pay for that somehow. And so if I send Karina full Bitcoin, which is worth like 28 grand, it might cost us 50 cents to verify that transaction. Very, very minimal. Some cryptos are even, even cheaper. I know Kelly says she's holding some Ripple, XRP. Ripple, you could probably send that for like three cents. Different cryptos are different uh, expenses. But anyways, that's why the fees are there. It's just a, a there's, although there's no middleman, there are like some, some uh, verification processes in place. Cool. So what are the benefits of actually holding Bitcoin? Well, there's hundreds of benefits holding Bitcoin, but here are 16 that probably are going to affect you today. The price of it is likely going up. If you get some now, you can probably sell it for a lot more later. I'll explain why in chapter three. Now, as I said earlier, I believe the price will be $1 million per coin by the year 2035. Here's how it's performed over the last 365 days, by the way. It's up over 60%. You cannot say the same for any other stock or asset or commodity that people are, that, 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 uh, uh, that your banker would suggest you invest in. The next closest thing I believe to this over the past 365 is like maybe like the NASDAQ or something, and maybe it was up like 10% or something, but not 60%. Real estate, nowhere close. Maybe some places on the planet has gone up this much, but this is like, extreme, like this would be so rare for, for any asset to do. And on average, over the past 10 years, Bitcoin's averaged about 200% per year increase so for people to say like, oh bitcoin's down now from when it was at its highest yeah but it's averaged 200 percent increase since its inception just since the past 10 years not even its inception next benefit of, of holding bitcoin that's what we're talking about the benefits of holding bitcoin is number one the price is likely to go up number two it's weightless so you can travel with it it's a digital property there's no need to struggle with carrying around heavy bags of silver or gold anymore recently i First, I had to sell all my gold because I'm traveling and I couldn't carry it with me. So I typically spend maybe a month or two in every country I seem to, to visit or less. I don't want to be carrying gold and silver with me tra traveling to the airport. I want to carry a backpack and that's about it. So with Bitcoin, it's weightless. I can carry it in my head. Uh, it's decentralized, as we said. So it can't be frozen like fiat currency. Can Like a government right now, they can freeze your bank account. And the bank itself can go out of business. Like Silicon Valley Bank, just do a Google search on see what happened to Silicon Valley Bank. It went out of business. It went bankrupt with people's money in it. Bitcoin is not going to happen. It's decentralized. It's hard to lose, right? You can store the keys in your head. You can also give your keys to several people you trust. And the cool thing about Bitcoin, check this out. This is, this is a pretty cool concept. Bitcoin... If you keep your Bitcoin on like a cold storage device, which you should, you, it will automatically generate a seed phrase for you. You might want to write that word down, seed phrase. It's a very important word. That word will allow you to get your coins back if you ever lose your device. So for example, here's my device. This is called the Nano Ledger. It's a Nano Ledger X, I believe. I use this to access my Bitcoin. My Bitcoin is not stored on the internet. 
gets stolen on a cold storage device. But if I lose this device, by the way, like somebody comes and steals this device, or I lose it, it breaks, it, it sinks in the ocean. What do I do with my Bitcoin? Do I lose my Bitcoin? No. If I have the seed phrase, which is 24 words, I can get it back. The 24 words have to be in order. So if the words is like dog, pony, tree, water bottle, ocean, you have to have those words in order, all 24 of them. So what you can do though, to make sure that those words are kept safe, you might think, oh, I'll write them down on a piece of paper and I'll give them to my uncle. Okay, what if your uncle dies? Now you're screwed. So what you can do actually is you can, you can create several copies of those words. You can give one copy to your uncle, one copy to your mom. It has to be people you absolutely trust. You can create multiple copies of those 24 words. But whoever has those 24 words has access to your Bitcoin. They don't need your permission to access it. The 24 words they're in, they have it all. So make sure you give it someone you trust. And what you could do is you can give 12 words to your mom and you can give 12 words to your best friend. And that way, if somebody goes to your mom with like a gun to her head and says, give me the, give me Korean's 24 words. She's like, I only have 12 of them. Right? So the person now needs to know who the other person is. So you probably don't give it to your best friend. You give it to some like random dude. But you could give your words to like random people. You could even give it to 24 random people. Wouldn't recommend that. But, you know, you can break it up. Provide the words somewhere. Or you could just memorize the 24 words. A poem. You could, uh, you could, you could write a story. And what about the obvious? I put a gun to your head. And I said, give me all your Bitcoins. You know every of the 24 words. What I mean... Yeah. By brute force, you could do that. But that's what people do in the real world when they want your gold watch in the street of Mexico. I mean, whatever. Yeah, but wherever people are held up at gunpoint. Yeah. So you know we, what I mean? Yeah. But you, I can't just reach in your bag and grab it. You know, I have to take you, I have to take you to gunpoint. And sure, that can happen. I'm sure that that does happen. But it's very hard it's much hard. That's like the that's like the hardest way of stealing someone's money is saying like, "Give me your password." You know, I can't just reach and grab it. I need your. I need you to tell me the password. And you you don't have to have all your Bitcoin all in one place. You could have multiple wallets of your Bitcoin. So you could have like ten percent of it here, thirty percent there, fifty percent there, whatever, seventy five percent there. So if someone does take it at gunpoint. Be like, okay, here's my Bitcoin. You give them the password. It's only ten percent of your Bitcoin. They don't know that though, right? So you don't have to have all your Bitcoin in one place. So if someone does that to me, I have the exact same thing in place. I have a wallet with like a little bit of Bitcoin in there. So I can be like, fine, take it. I give them that password. They're not giving my actual amount. They're getting the tiny wallet. So you can do that. So uh, hard to, it's hard to confiscate as we just discussed. Um, and the cool thing about Bitcoin, it can be divided to 100 million subunits. So you don't need to buy an entire Bitcoin to begin investing. This makes it very affordable for people who don't even have a lot of money right now. Uh, you can't do this with physical real estate. You can't do this with like gold either. You need to buy like a whole bar of gold, right? But real estate, to invest in a home, you need to buy the entire home. Unless you're growing it with a bunch of different people. Um, but Bitcoin, you can buy one one millionth of a coin. So you can start investing with Bitcoin with like a dollar today. And this allows everyone on the planet to tap into the global economy. There are 6 billion people right now that are unbanked. They don't, they don't have access to a bank account like you do. If you have a credit card or bank account right now, well, you're one of, I don't know, two and a half billion people. The other 6 billion do not have banks. But Bitcoin can help all of these people without banks become their own bank. They can store and grow their purchasing power in a safe place. That's the thing about Bitcoin too. It, it, it replaces the need for a bank. I don't need a bank account anymore. I can be my own bank. 
Um, Bitcoin doesn't require anyone to trust anyone or anything else either. So it's it's considered trustless. This means for the first time in human history, people can count on a reliable, unbreakable protocol to send the money they want sent and to make sure they receive the money they've been sent without needing to trust anyone. So as I said in the example with Kareen, if I send Kareen a Bitcoin, she doesn't need to trust me that it's a legitimate Bitcoin. It, there's built-in verification in place. I can't pull that whole lead gold thing I talked with Satya about earlier. You don't need to trust me that it's legit gold. It's Bitcoin is trustless. It's verified with proof of work. And the people that are verifying the transactions are completely unbiased because they don't know who they're verifying or what they're verifying. They're just solving equations as they mine. So it's, com it's completely, uh, emotions are taken out of it. Trust is taken out of it. That's pretty crazy to think about. Transactions are now trustless. It's all done by a protocol, programmed a protocol. And this is why it's important to like really study Bitcoin and research Bitcoin so you can like understand why it's trustless because otherwise in the back of your head, you'd be like, wait, do I still trust this thing? Once you understand how it works, you realize that one of the most beautiful things about it is it's taken trust out of the equation. It's a beautiful thing. Other benefit of holding Bitcoin is it can be sold instantly. I can sell some Bitcoin right now. Unlike gold or silver, real estate, which takes days or weeks to settle and require a ton of paperwork, Bitcoin can be bought and sold with a click of a mouse tap of a screen. What other property, what other investment is like that? Stocks are maybe the closest thing. Right? Maybe the closest thing. But like a stock is not property. A stock is like you owning part of a company. It's not like a physical piece of property. It's, it's not a digital property. Where Bitcoin is actual property. It's like digital real estate. It's only going to be 21 million. Of, it's like owning, owning, it's been said that owning a, owning a Bitcoin is like owning, owning a block of Manhattan. Digital Manhattan. Digital real estate. It's finite. Um, the Bitcoin also has a fixed supply. So unlike gold, where the supply fluctuates based on the price, meaning, let's break this down, by the way, if the price of gold goes up, guess what happens to gold mines? Price of gold is going up. What happens to gold mines? What would you do if you had a gold mine and the price of gold is going up? You own a gold mine. You mine gold. I would increase production. Yeah, you would. Thank you. So as the price- I went to economic school back in the day. Sorry. Yeah. It's so the same principle. If you own a gold mine and you make money selling gold and mining gold and the price of gold is going up, you'd be wise to mine more faster. And then what would you do if the price of gold starts tanking going way down? Are you incentivized to mine a whole bunch really fast and sell it? No, you wait for the price to go back up, right? So the, the supply of gold is like totally questionable. It we don't we don't even know like we could find a jackpot of a gold mine in the Atlantic Ocean tomorrow, or an asteroid could hit with a bunch of gold on it, whatever. We could find a bunch in the Antarctica or something. We don't know. Uh, whereas with Bitcoin, we know exactly how much Bitcoin's coming down the pipeline. As of today, right now, as of this recording, October 7th, 2023, 900 Bitcoin, give or take, are mined every day. 900 new ones are put into circulation. By 2024, only 450 will be mined every day. It gets cut in half every four years. So by 2028, only 225 will be mined every day, and so on and so forth. And by the year 2140, based on it kind of getting cut in half every four years, by the year 2140, no more new Bitcoin will be mined. So the supply, incoming supply is completely fixed, and we can see that the total amount of Bitcoin is capped. This is absolutely a huge 
advantage to Bitcoin over any other asset class. Because you know what's coming. Pop quiz. If there is a steady, if there's a steady demand for something, but the supply gets cut in half, what happens to the price? Price goes up. This goes up. Thank you, Tatiana. Now, what if there is an increased demand for something and the supply gets cut in half? Julia fell for the trick. Let's draw this out, guys. If there's a steady supply, sorry, steady demand, we'll say D for demand. That's a, supposed to be a, a D. If there's a steady demand for something, but the price, or sorry, but the, geez, but the supply now gets cut in half, the price goes what, up or down? Up. Yeah. The price mm -hmm. goes up. That's with a steady demand, right? Now, what if the demand is actually going up and the supply gets cut in half? It grows even faster. Even price. faster. Thank you. Yeah, so what we have with Bitcoin is every four years, what happens? Supply gets cut in half, baby. Every four years, the supply gets cut in half. So I'm going to show you a chart right now that shows you exactly what happens every four years. Watch this. Remind me to come back to where we are. Let me come back to where we are. Right here. What is this? This is a chart that shows the halving every four years. So in the first halving, it's demarcated by this black line. The black line is the halving. So at the half at the halfway at the at the uh, black line mark, guess what happened afterwards? Price go up or down? What's this yellow box? Speak. It went up. Price no. went up. Price went up. Okay, and then it flatlined a bit, and then there's another black line. What's the black line mean? Having. Having, what happens after the having? Jump. Yeah. Price went up. Why would the price go up after the having? Can someone explain that to me? That's psychology. It's because people realize it. It's economy, economics one-on-one. If there's a steady demand and the supply gets cut in half, price goes up. If there's an increased demand and the supply is cut in half, it goes up even more. With Bitcoin, you're either going to be experiencing a steady demand or an increased demand. As of right now, we're seeing an all-time high, all-time high, a record high of Bitcoin holders who haven't sold any Bitcoin whatsoever in the past year. The number of long-term Bitcoin holders is at an all-time high, meaning we're sticking around for the long term. We are not prepared to sell. And more people are buying and buying and buying and buying. So steady demand, supplies will get cut in half in the next. Uh, you can go to this website, by the way. I don't know what it's called. Uh, I think it's called like the happening. Um, yeah, 200 days from now. In 200 days exactly from the time of this recording, the Bitcoin supply will get cut in half. So why do you think I'm stocking up on Bitcoin now before the halving takes place? Because the price will go up. So I want to get it at the, I want to get it at the cheaper rate. No. 
right? So that's another benefit to holding Bitcoin, um, fixed supply. It's also therefore deflationary. So as governments around the world print more and more of their monopoly money, inflation occurs. The best hedge against inflation, a long-term deflationary store of value. So pop quiz for you guys right now. Is it a good idea for you to buy a bunch of iPhone 15s and think five years from now, these will be worth a lot more than I just bought them for? Definitely not. No. You know that because every year what happens to the value of your phone? It goes down a lot. Down a lot. So that's why I'm selling my Tesla right now because Teslas are like phones in that every year the Teslas get way better because they're it's like a new technology, electric cars. Gas cars hold their value pretty well because gas cars don't really get much better. They're kind of maxed out on how good they get. Electric cars are getting so much better every year. And so that means the previous year's models goes down in value significantly. So my Tesla just sitting there right now in Canada, not doing anything. Is it smart for me to sell that Tesla now before it goes down in value more? Or should I hold on to it for another five years? Sell it. Sell it. And do what with it? Buy Bitcoin. <laughs> Buy Bitcoin. Put it into a long-term deflationary store of value. Right? So what is the best? long-term inflation story value. It's an asset that's ther thermodynamically sound. And the most thermodynamically sound asset is Bitcoin. Bitcoin was designed to become stronger in times of inflation. So inflation only strengthens the purchasing power of Bitcoin while it weakens the purchasing power of the US dollar. So check out this chart. It shows you the purchasing power of the US dollar. It shows you how the purchasing power has been a massive decline ever since the U.S. got up the gold standard and began printing more money. So the buying power equivalent for $100 in 1799. So in 1799, you can see inflation was way down here. And as of 2019, which has gone up even way higher since due to COVID, um, it's way, way up here. This is inflation in a nutshell. Boom. Right around this time, right around 1974, I believe it was, I think it was 1975 or something, we got off the gold standard. And then boom! Meaning the US dollar used to be pegged to the price of gold. And now, not anymore. Boom. So Bitcoin preserves and grows purchasing power. It doesn't erode it. Do, do you, do you, yes or no, do you want your dollar to have the same purchasing power as the Venezuelan Boulevard? Here's what happened to the Boulevard. How many Boulevards do you need for one US dollar? Well, in 2008, it was this much. In 2019, it was this much. Now, boom. You need 1,600 Venezuelan Boulevards to equal one US dollar. This is called hyperinflation. How about the Zimbabwe dollar? In 19, uh, in the year 2003, you can see, I can't see the exact numbers, it's too small. You only needed this many uh, Zimbabwe dollars to equal one US dollar. Now you need thousands of Zimbabwe dollars to equal US dollar, hyperinflation. As more and more inflation takes place, people are going to look for places to invest their money so it doesn't lose all the profits. Uh, sorry, it doesn't, doesn't lose all its purchasing power like it did for Venezuela, Zimbabwe, and Germany. In 1923, due to hyperinflation in Germany, the exchange rate between the US dollar and the mark was 1 trillion marks to $1, meaning a wheelbarrow full of money in German marks would not even buy a newspaper. And most Germans had no idea this was coming. They were taken by complete surprise. So if you go back and Google this, you go look and see what happened in Ger to the German mark in 1923. This is good history to learn. Also go and do some research on, oh, let me plug my laptop in. Oh, that's funny. Wow, we're lucky. 
I plugged it in, but I didn't have this part plugged in. But yeah, I recommend doing a little research on history to see what happened to the German mark in 1923, see what happened to the uh, Zimbabwe dollar in, I believe, 2007 or eight. And look what happened to the Venezuelan Boulevard. Because this could very well happen to the US dollar, Canadian dollar, Australian dollar, any currency for that matter. Another benefit is Bitcoin lowers the likelihood of war. When countries invade other countries, they do it to try and take their money. Uh, but with Bitcoin, as Pranel pointed out, it's extremely hard to take countries' money if they store it in Bitcoin. What are they going to do? Go to every citizen and say, give us your money at gunpoint? Like, it's extremely hard to confiscate someone's wealth when it's in Bitcoin. Extremely difficult. If it's in gold, no problem. Go in there, pillage the village, take it all. Nothing they can do about it. But if it's in Bitcoin, it's very hard to get. Um, it's also the only truly scarce asset you can buy. No, we know there's only going to be 21 million of them. Having just one Bitcoin means you're going to have one 21th millionth of all financial energy in the world. This ensures it's going to remain valuable over time. So if you know right now, let's just pretend that there's only 21 pieces of property on planet Earth that you can buy, real estate. 21 blocks of land. Would you say that's a lot of blocks of land or not a lot of blocks of land? It's 21 million properties you can buy on planet Earth. That would increase pricing, obviously. Only 21 million. Would you want to own one of them? Yeah, and that's that's why I, my chain jumps off. Because if I'm not thinking to understand this in my own like financial situation and my uh, selfish planning, how will this work? How does it not require any trust when somebody thought out and built this system digitally? And who controls that with the halving uh, idea and structures it and mindset and everything? Yeah, great I mean, so it's kind of like the internet where it's open public protocol. The internet is not owned by one person. We can anyone who uses the internet, anyone who does like ten minutes of research, can like see how the internet is set up and how it's completely decentralized. And so there's not one person deciding this is the policy of the internet. But I've heard about the dark web and that doesn't sound like a very nice place. So how can there not be a dark financial dark. web to take over? You understand? Yeah, the dark web is a layer of the internet. It's a layer. It's a layer. So Bitcoin is... It's black hats. So Bitcoin is its own layer. People can create okay. all like Ethereum and Litecoin and all sorts of crap coins, whatever. It's not Bitcoin. Bitcoin, like you can create dark web, but that's not the internet. The dark web is like the dark web. It's like its own thing. You can create all sorts of stuff on the internet, but it's like the internet is not um, owned by anyone. It's a public protocol. You can build a website without anyone's permission. You can upload anything you want on the internet. It might be illegal, but you can upload it, right? So everything uh, you're asking about like the 21 million and how do we know if we're sure it's going to be finite to the 21 million it's because it's publicly visible. It's in code. It's written in code. You can see it as a programmer. You can go and you can look at the code of Bitcoin. You can see that it's, oh, it's like you can see the equation. The equation clearly states one plus one equals two and two plus two equals four and so on and so forth. And so it's all pre-written out. And there's millions of programmers around the world who grew up programming. All they do is program things all day long and they all look at the Bitcoin code and they think, well, this is the most beautiful code I've ever seen. It's very clean, it's very elegant, it's very transparent. It's hard for a non-coder to understand it, but it's kind of like you don't need to understand how electricity works for you to benefit from it, right? You shouldn't lay No, but I need to trust that it works. And you, yeah. and you said it was a trustless. Yeah, it's um, trustless between the users. That's it. Trustless between yeah. users for you to... Trust the system. You have to understand the system. Uh, uh, yeah, somehow you need to to utilize it and put your values in as it, treat yeah. it like an asset. You need to understand it. So, like, you need to understand gold and yeah, trust that you can get like, a value. Right it's kind of like too. Uh, if if technology when airplanes are brand new, right? Airplanes are brand new technology. Pretend Zoom. We're on right now. Zoom. Pretend Zoom was around before airplanes. 
which doesn't seem that unrealistic. Creating Zoom seems pretty a lot easier than creating a freaking airplane, right? <laughs> if Zoom was created before airplanes, there would be people on Zoom like me right now telling you why airplanes are the future of transport technology. Then there'd be people like you, no doubt, saying, well, how do I know the airplanes aren't going to fall out of the sky? And all I could tell you is like, well, we understand the physics. We fly like 10,000 airplanes a day. None of them fall out of the sky. One out of every blah, 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 whatever, you know, might kill someone, right? But like the, the just physics is how they work. And you can, you want, if you want to study how airplanes work, you can dive deeper into that by all means. If you want to understand how Bitcoin really works, you can dive deeper in that if you wish. Or you could just go along with it and realize that, hey, it works. You know, so. Okay, I'm cool with it. I'm just uh, asking all the stupid questions. <laughs> no, no, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. But again, if, if airplanes were existed today, we'd be asking the same questions you're asking about Bitcoin, right? It's like, how do we know? It's a good question. Um, Bitcoin, very low transaction fees, as we talked about. Like, I, I pay all my team, by the way, with Bitcoin. I used to pay my team with PayPal and bank transfers. And every time I pay my team member, like if my team, let's say, made 10 grand, a team member made 10 grand, and nowadays some of my team members are making 20 grand a month, I send them 20 grand over PayPal. What's 3% of 20 grand? Well, what's 3% of $10,000? It's 20 grand. 3% of $10,000 is 300 bucks. So times two, 600 bucks. We're paying $600 in fees. If I came over to you right now and stole $600 from your pocket, would you mind? Yeah, sure. But but you made 20 grand. Why do you care? It's just three percent. You know, that's how they get away with this. They they're like, oh, it's just three percent. Like, no, forget the percentage. What's the amount? Six hundred bucks. It's crazy. So Bitcoin doesn't do that. Bitcoin, Bitcoin charges you a small flat rate. It could like with the Bitcoin, you can move a billion dollars for two bucks. So buy, buy PayPal. We don't use PayPal anymore. We don't use the banks anymore. Like Bitcoin's already replacing these old ancient technologies. It's a beautiful thing. Unlike real estate, Bitcoin is no maintenance fees. It's no, there's no upkeep costs. You don't have to hire a lawnmower. Like right now I have to pay some dude to cut my lawn every month, even though I'm not there because otherwise I'll get fined by the city for having my weeds overgrowing. Like real estate's a pain in the ass, man. I got to sell that thing fast. Uh, but yeah, no maintenance fees. It's a beautiful thing. What other property, even gold, you got to maintain that. You got to store it somewhere. You got to pay to store it. Bitcoin's free to store. It's free to store, free to maintain. And lastly, relatively easy to use and understand. I'll say relatively. Anyone of any age can use Bitcoin as long as they know how to interact with the computer or a smartphone. Can't say the same for all the paperwork involved with real estate. So although these were just 16 points, it's impossible to find any other asset with the same list of benefits. Bitcoin is a one and only. And this is why I say anyone who spends 10 hours studying Bitcoin is never going to find another asset more appealing for investment. I Sorry, heard... I have a question. Yeah. So let's say... 10 years from now, you have $1 million from Bitcoin that you made. Can you buy like a house with that or can you buy stuff with that? Or Sorry, you're going to ask me that again in one second, okay? Because I made a huge mistake five minutes ago. I said, oh, no, I didn't make a mistake. I was correct. I did the wrong math. I thought 3% of 20 grand was something else. 3% of 20 grand is 600 bucks actually. Doesn't sound like it though, does it? How is that correct? But according to Google, it is. Like, doesn't that doesn't that like not compute in your mind though? How is three percent twenty grand six hundred bucks? Am I missing something? No, it sounds about right. 
three percent that's it it's 600 bucks well i if someone's watching the replay and i make a huge mistake please let me know but like this is mind-blowing this is what i was paying in fees every month for years not to mention the not to mention the exchange rate they also screw you on the exchange rate so if you get paid in say american dollars you're going to pay someone in canadian you're going to get screwed on the exchange rate if you get paid in Canadian, you got to convert it to American. You get paid in um, what I get paid now in is um, uh, Durham. I got to convert that to USD. That's they screw you on the exchange rate, man. Now I just buy Bitcoin. Beautiful. I skip the exchange rates. I skip the fees. Oh, life's good. Saving thousands of dollars a month. Hands up if you want to save thousands of dollars a month. Hmm. Boom. Green, what was your question? But what about all the small purchases? I mean, $39 for this month in school? Group. Yeah, I mean, pay with that with the Bitcoin credit card. I don't see that on, on the payment subscription page. You see a credit card option, correct? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah, I put in my credit card. Yeah, so you can put in a Bitcoin credit card instead. You're using a bank credit card. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I think you Is just that that <laughs> like my question was like can you buy things with bitcoin like is everything going to turn into that like i could buy a house with bitcoin like let's say just an example tesla accepting bitcoin for payment this was huge news you can buy you can buy um tesla's with bitcoin you can buy, but it's not everything that you could buy with Bitcoin yet, not yet right? Not yet, because it's still relatively new. It's just like okay, so. back in the day, you'd be like, "Oh, is like is um is Nike on the internet yet?" Well, not yet, but Adidas is. Mm. Like certain companies are getting there. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll talk with that too in terms of um adoption and and its utility coming up here. But yeah, if I mean right now, like already, uh, I'm already using Bitcoin. I went to Iceland two weeks ago to see Mike Posner, hang out with Mike for a week. I didn't have the ability to send cash. I was in Russia. I couldn't even use my Canadian credit card. I was in Russia. Canada blocked all my credit cards. I was unable to spend any money from my bank. I wanted to go to Iceland. I wanted to spend money on this trip. How do I buy a trip to Iceland without money? without currency, I sent Bitcoin. I sent Bitcoin two days later, I'm in Iceland, chilling with Mike Posner and a bunch of amazing people. Got the flight with Bitcoin, got the hotel with Bitcoin. It's beautiful. So you can buy a lot of stuff. Yeah, every everywhere, every almost every shop I go into now, in the same way I used to ask every restaurant I went to, hey, do you have vegan options? In fact, I still do, just even if I know they don't, just to like to plant the seed. I'll be like, why don't you have any vegan options? Tell the chef, come on, man. Now, everywhere mm -hmm. you go, I say, do you accept Bitcoin? Mm -hmm. And five years ago, no one knew what the hell I was talking about. They're like, what's that? Now, they're like, oh, no, not yet, sir. Sorry. Soon, soon, soon. Like, it's coming, it's coming. Like, it's, you keep asking, do you accept Bitcoin? Do you accept Bitcoin? You'll see, you'll see it start to change. Uh, but yeah, I, I went to, I went to the airport the other day. I had to pay a taxi. How to pay him? Bitcoin. Didn't have the cash. Chapter three. Why will the price of Bitcoin keep going up? Here are 12 reasons right now why I see the price of Bitcoin going up and up and up and up and up and up. So God knows how much. Some people are predicting $10 million per coin, $100 million per coin, and much higher. So supply and demand 101, wherever there's high demand and low supply, the price goes up. And as more money comes into Bitcoin, the price can only go up because the supply is fixed. And guess what's coming? More money, as we'll see. Developing countries are getting on board. Do you know half the planet isn't even on the internet right now? Wait till the other half the planet, the other 50% of humans get on the internet. What's the money that they're going to use on the internet? Is it the Zimbabwe dollar? Who's going to accept the Zimbabwe? Is it going to be the the uh, the Turkish lira? Who, 
Kareen, would you accept the Turkish lira right now for your course? No. <laughs> like, I don't want that garbage. No. Hmm. Would you accept Bitcoin? Yeah. Yeah, boom. So all these developing countries are getting on board. The only currency they can all agree on will be the Bitcoin. The only question is how many trillions of dollars are coming? Well, as we know, we don't know how many trillions, but we know trillions are coming in faster than any other large asset class in history. And because people die with their Bitcoins every day, like people die with thousands of Bitcoins every day and people lose the keys to Bitcoins every day. The supply of Bitcoin is actually going down. There's less in circulation. And with an increasing demand and a lowering supply, the price can only go up. It's economics 101. That's reason number one. Lower supply, increased demand. So this alone, this reason alone is enough to buy Bitcoin. Even if you don't understand anything else I say. The fact that people want something, there's less of it, and more people want it, what's going to happen? It can only go up. But let's go into some other reasons. ETFs, BlackRock, if you don't know what BlackRock is, Google them. BlackRock and Vanguard are the two most powerful companies on the planet. And BlackRock right now is pushing for a Bitcoin ETF. An ETF is an electronic trans electronic electronic traded fund, an exchange traded fund. I always call it electronic traded fund, an exchange traded fund. So look what happened to gold when an ETF was introduced. On the left was prior to the ETF. Gold stayed steady for a while. In fact, between 1983 to the year 2004, price of gold is pretty much the same. What happened in 2004? It went up. Why? Why, Kareem? Because there is more demand and the value went up. Why did the value go up? Because people wanted it more, no? There was accessibility. The ETF made it accessible. So an ETF means that you can now buy an asset without actually holding the asset. So how many of you so far are like, I love the idea of Bitcoin, but I'm scared of like buying and holding it myself in case I lose it. Anyone? Because millions of people like that, my mom included. My mom is like, like, she loves the idea of Bitcoin, but she doesn't want to like hold it and deal with it. So I hold her Bitcoin for her. I think I'm scared of a bubble. Because I've tried bubbles, a bubble. Okay. I've that's, tried bubbles yes. in the economy. That, that, that's a whole other conversation. But just in terms of like holding the asset as, a, as an actual tangible thing, are you afraid of having it or are you afraid of losing it? Or sorry, would you be afraid of having it and losing it or are you fine with that? No, but I look at the, at the, the value drop after COVID. There was a big increase and in sure. a big but value drop. Price aside, though, like price aside, though, are you comfortable with holding Bitcoin in your own possession? I don't care about that part, really. Reason Only ask, the value. Reason I ask is because a lot of people don't want to actually hold it, especially like big companies. Because let's say, let's say you're Apple, okay? You're Apple or you're Nasdaq or you're uh, sorry, not Nasdaq. You're Apple or you're Microsoft, you're IBM. How are you going to buy and hold Bitcoin? Who's who in your company is going to listen? Tim Cook is going to hold the Bitcoin. You know, Jeff Bezos is going to hold the Bitcoin in Amazon. Like, who's actually going to hold it? So big companies don't like to buy a bunch of gold. Where are they going to store it? So an ETF allows them to buy into the idea of gold and have some other company do the storing for them. And so this ETF in gold allowed billions, if not trillions, of dollars to come into gold. Because now these companies didn't need to deal with it. Other companies could deal with it. And as a result, more money flooded into the system. Boom, gold skyrocketed. Never been as low ever since. Because now all these companies are holding gold on paper. And some other companies actually holding the security of the gold itself. So, for example, 
right now. Like you guys could theoretically, not saying you're going to do this, but you theoretically could just pay me a thousand bucks and I go buy the Bitcoin for you and deal with it, everything. You wouldn't have to deal with getting an exchange or a hardware wallet, remembering your password. Just give me a thousand bucks. I'll deal with it. That is a beautiful service, a beautiful offer for a lot of people. Like my mom, she doesn't want to deal with it. She's like, Ted, here's some money. Deal with it. My dad, my sister, here's some money. Deal with it. They don't want to own that shit and deal with that shit. So ETFs allow people to buy Bitcoin, buy, allows companies really to buy Bitcoin and people without actually needing to hold it themselves. Some other company will hold it for you, like BlackRock. BlackRock wants to hold your Bitcoin. So an ETF, it turns commodities like Bitcoin, it turns them into a stock that you can buy. It can, you can, and the stock can be purchased with borrowed money, no less, essentially allowing you to buy Bitcoin with zero dollars down, no upfront payment. So not only you give me a thousand bucks and I'll deal with the Bitcoin, you don't even have to put up your own thousand bucks. You can use margin accounts, money you don't even have to buy that Bitcoin. So let's say you know Bitcoin's going up or you're really bullish on Bitcoin. You're really excited about the idea of Bitcoin. But you don't have too much money to put down. What do you do? Use a margin account. You spend $10,000 on Bitcoin that you don't even have. When Bitcoin goes up to 100 grand, congrats, you just made a 90 grand profit with money that you didn't even have. That's amazing. So ETFs allow you to do that. And as a result, Bitcoin ETF is going to allow billions of dollars to come into Bitcoin. And now pop quiz, guys, what happens when billions of dollars comes into Bitcoin and the supply stays steady? Price can only go up. Price can only go up. Again, that alone is reason enough for me to load up on Bitcoin. Right now, billions of dollars are actually locked behind the fact that investors can't invest in Bitcoin, even if they wanted to. There's billionaires who want to invest in Bitcoin, but they can't because their company doesn't allow for it. And ETF will solve that. And the first gold ETF was introduced, the price of gold skyrocketed. And that's because accessibility. The introduction of gold spot ETFs made it much easier for investors to gain exposure to gold without actually owning or storing the metal. With increased accessibility comes a rising demand. The surge in demand contributes an upward pressure on gold prices. And as price went up, more people bought. As Sati said, he bought at the top. Price goes up, people want more. There are many other reasons. I'm not going to go into depth on right here because I want to get through and maybe do some Q&A. But fair value accounting is another huge reason why the price of Bitcoin is probably going to go up. The halving, which we talked about, is another reason the price of Bitcoin is probably going to go up. Like it's gone up every other four years. Scarcity awareness, another big reason. In fact, if you look at the price of Bitcoin and then you look at Google Trends to see how many people are searching for the word Bitcoin, this bottom chart shows you Google interests, uh, people searching the word Bitcoin. The code directly correlates to the price of Bitcoin. The higher the price, the more interest there is in Bitcoin. Another reason is banks are going to start carrying custody of Bitcoin. And when banks take custody, they can actually lend out against it. And this is going to attract way more investors who don't want to custody their own Bitcoin. They say, hey, I want the bank to carry the Bitcoin for me. Um, ease of use. So Visa and MasterCard are now offering Bitcoin credit cards. Most of my credit card purchases now are done through my CL card, which you can actually get. I think you can, can you Google it? Is it right here? Yeah, right there. I'll, I'll put a link to it. You can get a CL card right here. Bam. Uh, right there. You can, yeah, they need to do a better website, but instant fiat conversion at the time of purchase. So store your stuff in Bitcoin. And then when you're ready to buy something, boom, it gets translated into fiat currency and you can buy stuff with it. So school, you can use a crypto card for that. <laughs> Ease of access is increasing. So Coinbase, Crypto.com, PayPal are all making it easier to buy stuff with Bitcoin. As Kareen was asking, Elon Musk said here, you can now buy Tesla with Bitcoin. Um, it's just getting easier and easier to use. And the demand will increase as more people start seeing other people use it. 
countries are making a part of their currency. If you travel to El Salvador, it's like their main currency now. It's their legal tender. El Salvador, like everyone uses Bitcoin in El Salvador. Because they're they, El Salvador realizes their currency is going to crap unless they put it into Bitcoin. Another reason the price is going up most likely is because we're still in the very early days. There's only 460 million Bitcoin wallets in existence right now. It's not a lot. That's not a lot of people, man. Do you know how many people are on the internet? Five point three billion users are on the internet. How many of them have a Bitcoin wallet? Four hundred sixty million, and that's that's not even saying these are four hundred sixty million unique wallets. Meaning, like, I personally have three or four wallets. So, if we assume that this number gets cut in half, which is highly likely, there's more likely like two hundred fifty million users, ish. Here's the adoption rate of the internet and here's the adoption rate of Bitcoin price. Bitcoin. Pretty incredible. Um, inflation, just, just the, okay, by the way, when I say Bitcoin's going to a million bucks, that doesn't mean you're gonna have a million dollars worth of purchasing power. By the time Bitcoin gets to a million bucks, a million bucks is only going to be worth like 500 grand because inflation just eats away at the value of it. So as more money gets printed, everything will go up in price, including Bitcoin, just by virtue of the fact that everything goes up in price. Doesn't make the million dollars as powerful at all. Um, as more fiat gets printed, the fiat itself becomes worth less and less and thus requires more and more to buy the same thing. So you look at this example of fiat, it's buying you less and less. You look at Bitcoin, it's buying you more and more and more. It's the opposite, deflation. Chapter four, final chapter, how to actually Bitcoin. To begin accumulating Bitcoin, the first step is to get a wallet. You can get a wallet on an exchange like Coinbase.com or Crypto.com and connect it to your bank so you can easily withdraw it and buy more. That's step one. But as a warning, if your crypto is on an exchange, it's not actually in your possession and you risk losing it due to being hacked or the company stealing your coins, the company shutting down. This has happened many times. Most recent one was FTX. You Google F what happened with FTX or the most early example is Mt. Gox. This happened to my sister. She got screwed on Mt. Gox. All those Bitcoins she had in the early days were on, uh, let's say research, Mt. Gox and FTX. These were two of like the biggest exchanges that some of the most notable crypto investors recommended using. It's like me right now saying Coinbase and Crypto.com. So these are like the top two exchanges, but they're not safe for long-term storage. You use them to get in and get out. It's like a gateway. It's like a, it's a, it's a, it's a bridge. You don't park your car on a bridge and hope it's there in a hundred years. If you want your car to be there in a hundred years, where do you park it? Somewhere super safe, like in a big steel box, not on a bridge. There's a famous phrase in crypto that says, "Not your keys, not your coins." Meaning, if your coins are on Coinbase or Crypto.com, they're on exchange, then they're not your coins. They're the exchange's coins. If the coins are hidden behind your keys, your passphrase, right, the, those 24 words that we talked about, if your coins are hidden behind your 24 words, then they're actually your coins. If you're going to use an exchange, buy the crypto on the exchange and then transfer it to your cold storage wallet as soon as possible for safety. So that's the next step. Once you set up your wallet on exchange, you get a cold storage device. For non-English, can you explain what does cold storage mean in that context? Yeah. Uh, Is it a physical object? Yeah, well, like a, a, kind of. Stick? 
Yeah, it's like this right here. It, it this just allows okay. you to access it. So your crypto, it, this is a weird thing to understand. I still have a hard time wrapping my head around what I'm about to tell you, but I'll do my best to tell it to you anyway. Your crypto, your Bitcoin, is not actually stored on this device. This device just lets you see and access your crypto. But it's not actually so on So it's a key? It's a key. I could, I could snap this in half right now and throw it in the ocean and lose it. And I still have access to all my coins because I have the 24 words. Okay. This is just a key. Yeah. But do you put it into a computer? Put it into this. Or you think you're putting into this. You're Really what you're doing, this has a address associated with it. Yeah. So the address associated with this, let's pretend the address associated with this is one, two, three, Bitcoin. Let's just pretend that's the address, okay? If I lose this device, I can get another device, put in my 24 words, boom, and I get to access one, two, three, Bitcoin. I can access the same address through multiple keys. But it, does it have a display? Does it do anything? Yeah. Is it like a little you plug this into the, plug into the computer and you can see all your Bitcoin. Okay. So it is like a USB. It's just a different thing. Yeah. Okay. It gives you the illusion that the Bitcoin's on here, but it's 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 actually not. That's the weird trippy part. The Bitcoin's actually on. Okay. The so it's a key to your account yeah. or whatever, your, your vault. So once you set up a wallet on an exchange like Coinbase or Crypto, you get a cold storage device. I use the Nano Ledger like I just showed you, but I may be switching to another one soon just due to security issues. I've heard some things that aren't so favorable for the Ledger long term, and I want to be in this for the long term. You may want to use something like a Trezor or another cold storage device, but I recommend just clicking on this link, watching the first 10 videos, spending an hour doing some research on different cold storage devices. But the Trezor, I've heard really, really good things about it's very good for beginners. But again, I use Nano Ledger, have not had any problems with it whatsoever. But the fact that 95% of my net worth is on this thing, I don't want to have it all on one thing that supposedly might have some security issues down the road. So you want to put it in one that you've done a lot of research on and that other people have done a lot of research on which is why I recommend clicking this and scrolling through some of the top rated videos on the best cold storage wallets. Make sure you check the recent ones. So this one's two months ago. This is four months ago. It's a year ago, four months ago. Is it? You'll start to notice some trends amongst them. And your goal in looking for these is you're trying to find layover, like you're trying to find crossover, like, oh, you watch like 20 videos, you might realize, hey, of the 20 videos I just watched, 50% of the people recommended this one. The other 50% were kind of like random. So I'm going to go for the one that most people recommended. Just do some research. It's, it's, tech is always changing. Once you have a cold storage device, like I have, you tell people to send Bitcoin to your cold storage device. So if you're going to send me Bitcoin today, I'd, send, I'd tell you, hey, send it to 123 Bitcoin. Pretend that's my address. Now, if you're like me and you want to invest more than 100 grand all at once and you want one on one support in doing this, you can sign up for Swan Private and you can just wire transfer them some money over something called OTC over the counter. So I didn't want to, uh, I was in Turkey at the time and I needed to get some money into Bitcoin when Bitcoin was like a lot cheaper than it is now. And I wanted it there fast. And so for a 1% fee, you can just wire transfer Swan Private some cash and they'll transfer, they'll put it into Bitcoin for you. So they'll take 1%. So if you send them a hundred grand, you can get $99,000 worth of Bitcoin. And they'll talk you through everything on Zoom call, one-on-one -on -one private. That's what I did. Uh, you learn more about Swan by visiting their website. But on an ongoing basis, there's two strategies that you should use or that you can use, I should say, for accumulating more and more Bitcoin, both of which I've used in the past. Number one is just buy and hodl. Hodl means hold. 
Uh, but this is where you just buy a bunch of Bitcoin all at once and hold on to it for a long time. Pro of this is you might get in at the best price, assuming the price doesn't drop after you buy in. So if you want to get the best price possible right now, let's pretend the price is, uh, let's just say it's 28 grand. You want to lock in that price? You just buy a bunch of it right now. And you forget about it. And I've done that. Just buy a bunch and I forget about it. Don't look at anyone. Just buy it and hold it. Don't look. Don't, 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 don't look at the freaking price every day. Like, oh, should I buy, should I sell, should I buy, should I sell? Buy it, just hold it. The con though is that this is going to cost you the most amount of money. It might stress you out if you're a beginner and you see the price start dropping below what you bought it for. So if you buy a bunch at, like we said, uh, 28 grand, but then the price goes down to 26 grand, like happened with Sati, you might be like, oh my God, I screwed up. I'm full of regret. What an idiot. I shouldn't do that ever again. So that's the con. So number two I recommend to eliminate that is the dollar cost average. This is when you just buy a consistent amount of Bitcoin every week, no matter what the price is doing. So if the price is up, you buy it. If the price is down, you buy it. It doesn't matter. An example, you just buy $500 worth of Bitcoin every week. If you invest with Swan, by the way, you can send Swan like 100 grand, and then you could tell Swan, hey, every week I want you to take $500 of that 100 grand and put it in Bitcoin. And we'll automatically buy Bitcoin for you with that 500 bucks that you set. So you can do that automatically with Swan. Um, but for most people, I do suggest going the DCA route, just dollar cost averaging, just buy it regardless. The pro is that dollar cost averaging allows you to not break the bank. 500 bucks goes out every week. You don't even notice it or every month. Totally up to you. Right? A month, you pick. Um, and it reduces your chances of regretting investing because you just buy anyway. The con is that you risk out missing out on the lowest possible price. So let's just say you start dollar cost averaging today at 28 grand. Next week, the price is 29 grand. Next week, the price is 30 grand. You just keep buying and buying and buying and buying. And you, then you might kick yourself like, oh, I should have just bought it all when it was 27 grand. But at least you keep getting it when it's slowly going up as opposed to missing out big time. But most people, I recommend the DCA route. That's what I did for the first few years. And then now I just dumped my life savings into it. So now what? Step one, open an account somewhere. Step two, get yourself a cold storage device. Find the best one here at the link. Step three, keep learning by watching videos like these every day. So I put together a playlist of some of my favorite videos. These videos I've watched multiple times. Everything you just saw me talk about has been learned from most of these people. I'll share this playlist with you here. I'll also give you this document. But there's the playlist. I recommend watching every single video on there. And here I will share you the link to this document. in the chat. Bam. Cool. That's that. That's a wrap. Uh, I'm curious what your thoughts are now and how, if at all, have your thoughts changed since the start of this session two hours ago? Cool, Ted. Um, I'm going to start off by saying that like when it's when the price of it's low, like no one's talking about it. Like I remember, like when it was high when I bought it, it was like all my friends, even like family members, they were like all talking about like crypto and um and everything as as well. So, and that's when most people end up buying. But like, I get it makes sense right now. What you're saying is right before they have it again, and they cut it. It's a better time to buy. So for the people that already have held on to their crypto from when they've bought it at a high price, what do you recommend for them? Is it just keep on holding on till it goes up to the price that they bought it at, or what would you suggest in that scenario? I want to show you a funny meme if I can find it. Um, it ex explains exactly what you mean, what you just described. 
Dang, can't find it. Okay, so I'm just gonna explain this meme and see if it's still funny. There's this meme, and it's like it shows a quadrant. So I'll draw it. This is important, by the way, not just funny. But in this meme, there's this dude telling his friend to buy Bitcoin. And the price in this image is 4,000. And his friend says, nah, N-A-H. I can't draw that, so I'll just write it. Friend's like, nah. And then in the next picture, it's these two guys again. And the price is, I'm not gonna draw two guys again, but the price is like 10K. And the friend is like, nah. And then the next picture, the price is like 20 grand. And the friend is telling the friend to buy it. And the friend's like, nah. And in the fourth picture, there's a, the two friends are standing in front of a television. And on the television, is CNN and CBC and all these big companies, TSN, saying, buy Bitcoin, buy Bitcoin, buy Bitcoin. And it, the price is like 50K. And the friend is like, yeah, okay. I'll buy it now. Now that it's on TV, right? So what did we talk about in that Google Doc that I showed you? We said how as the price of Bitcoin goes up, there's more Google searches about it, right? So there's a direct correlation, bro. This is like, you can Google this right now, Google Trends. More people search for Bitcoin right here, right here, right here. This top thing is the price and the bottom is the search trends. So if you know that the price of Bitcoin is going up, you want to be there first before everyone starts talking about it. There's this like, ethos in crypto where it's like by the time the taxi driver is talking about bitcoin you know it's time to sell by the time you get the third text message from your friend asking you if they should buy bitcoin you should stop buying bitcoin just hold that shit or sell it you know because it now words out so you want to get in but you want to get in when you have quote unquote insider information right and I'll give you three pieces of insider information right now that you should go and Google. So you don't just take my word for it. Go and Google these three pieces of insider information. Google B Bitcoin spot ETF. And then type in like, what effect will that have on the price? Then Google Bitcoin fair value accounting and what effect that will have on the price. And then Google banks taking custody of Bitcoin and what effect that will have on price. These are all three pieces of news that are yet to make mainstream news. This is like considered insider information, somewhat classified. You have to dig deep to find these things that I'm telling you. Once you Google them though, they'll be everywhere. You'd be like, well, this is just not on the mainstream news. You know why it's not on the mainstream news? Because BlackRock, the company that's pushing for the ETF, that's pushing for very Friday accounting, that's pushing for bank taking custody. They own the media. They are the owners of the news stations, bro. And guess who wants to buy the most Bitcoin in the world? BlackRock. Do they want everyone knowing about Bitcoin before they start loading up? No way. They want to keep the price down. They want to get it while it's still cheap. Then once they've loaded up, once they've, spend all the money they want to spend on it, the billions and trillions they want to spend on it, then they'll make it mainstream news. And that's why the price pumps like crazy, bro. Once the price pumps like crazy, what do they do? They sell. People get scared. Oh my God, look, the price is going down. Then they start selling like crazy. And then the price goes down and BlackRock just to buy it again. So for Pernil, scared of the bubble, we'll get in at the bottom. Don't buy in at the top, get in at the bottom.
Right now we're at a very nice steady. You say I should be the bubble, control the bubble. Hey, get in, get in while it's going up, just before it goes up. So um, again, not financial advice, but this is just what, this is how I see it. This is what I would do. But those three pieces of insider information, those pieces, three pieces of classified information, you realize how they've affected every other asset in history. What happened when gold got ETF? Boom. What happened when gold got fair value accounting? Boom. What happened when banks could take custody of gold? Boom. Guess what's coming to Bitcoin? All three of those things in succession. So, yeah, hopefully that answers uh, your question, which I'm not even sure what the question was at this point. Thank you, that did. Oh, uh... got into that track. Well, yeah, yeah, I think you answered everything, man. Like I had like three questions, but you answered them before I got <laughs> before you even got there. Cool. Yeah. Cool. But yeah, this workshop was really just a way for me to consolidate and organize a lot of what I've been researching over the past five, seven years. And I think by you going through this workshop now, I've can I've like put you on the the same sort of thinking path that I'm on. But it's up to you guys to continue this thinking path. And the only way you can do that is by continuously watching YouTube videos or reading articles about it. So every day personally, I listen to 20, 30 minutes minimum, usually like an hour's worth of Bitcoin videos on YouTube from different people. But I've I've linked to a lot of them inside of that playlist there for you. So just continue researching, continue learning. New stuff's happening every day in the Bitcoin space. It's, it's evolving. But um, you're only really going to care if you hold some. Why would you care about Bitcoin if you don't hold it? Once you start holding some, you'll, you'll start caring. So what you can do too as an entrepreneur, just to tie this into contentpreneurship, is just take all the profits you make Pay your team to help you make more money and then take whatever is left and decide how much of that you want to put into Bitcoin. Personally, for me, it's like 95%. Um, and then you can get clients to pay you with Bitcoin. So when we are when we do sales calls and someone says, okay, cool, how do I pay? We say, yeah, you, we can do PayPal. We can do credit card. We can do Bitcoin. Totally up to you. And we make it an option. So a good amount of our clients, maybe 10% at least, pay with Bitcoin. Yeah. Like I said, it's, it's uh, Ryan with Tatiana here. How are you doing? Hey, good man. How are you? Good. Hey, good to, good to see you. Good, good uh, info. Um, I've been buying, I've been buying um, some XRP and Ripple and stuff. And, um, I am, you know, I'm, I'm now really as well. Um, the sound quality? The sound quality is atrocious. I'm giving you a one out of ten. On oh, okay, okay. Here, it's she, here. So she's got. We're we're both we're sharing an earbud. So she's got the earbud that that actually has the mic. So I'm now right next to her ear. Okay. So can you hear me now? One out of ten. Great job. Okay. So so here so here's the deal. So um, what's the mechanism for for paying employees? Um, if I want to pay my employees, I've got about thirty people on my team. We're we're using Wise and all these other oh, dude, alternatives. You're filled with fees, man. I know it's junk. And um, actually, we just we just moved from Upwork specifically to Wise because Upwork is going to jack up their their uh, pricing, their fees. So we went to Wise, and now I'm I want to go to I just want to use Bitcoin. Dude, best move I ever made. I regret not doing it sooner. Such a silly boy I am for not doing that sooner. Um. Huh. Yeah, the the yeah. I'm not an expert with it because I just started doing it. But basically, I told my team, "Hey guys, 
going forward, if you want me to pay you on PayPal, like I have been, you're going to eat the fee. If you want me to pay you on Bitcoin, there will be no fee. What do you want to do? Okay. And, and, some, then, and then how? Some, of them, some and then, of them are like, some of them are like, keep paying me on PayPal. I'm like, cool. Okay, no problem. You're going to eat the fee though. <laughs> and then the basically... How, what's the mechanism of transfer that basically they just have that they have to have a bitcoin um you can say if like i said if you said if you if you connect with swan swan private mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you can set up a um you can have like you could put like a balance and you could keep like 20 grand in there or something i don't know how much you pay your team every month let's say you had 20 grand in there you could automatically uh, actually no that's for that's for automatic Set payouts. Forget that. Never mind. If you want to give your team a Bitcoin bonus every month, you could set that up through Swan Private. But you want to pay them all different amounts, right? So what we do is I just get my team to send me an invoice every month with their address on it. And I just open up my ledger and I just send money to that address. Okay. So... All right, I'll just I'll just look into that more. Um, yeah, we're trying to avoid fees as well. So, yeah, just, I, I mean, I like the ultimate. Yeah. Who, who, who do you have? Do you have someone right now paying people, or do you do all the payouts? Well, it's my my general manager does, and my operations manager, and it, like we've saved like two percent right just now from Upwork. Upwork was like three percent or something like that, you know, and yeah. now we pay through Wise, and it's like one percent, but or. Yeah, but sometimes there's, I don't know if you do conversion. Sometimes it gets greater than conversion too. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, and yeah, we do. And so, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I really am going to do this. I mean, I, because, yeah, the, the transactions are, they're much more secure. The conversion rate is, there's non existent. It's fast. The right? other great, the, well, the other great, yeah, it's fast. And the other great thing is, is that we do, we do work for, for clients internationally. So, you know, for them, we almost have to get paid via, you know, Bitcoin. Like, you know, we we do a special type of ad for Google and it just launched in, you know, in the UK and Europe and stuff. So that would be like the way to get paid. So, yeah. Man. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Best thing to do is get them to invoice you with their ID or their address and then just give your general manager access to, you know, one of the ledgers that you have and then um what you could do from your personal account or your business bitcoin account is um you send money from your main account that you personally have access to to feed into like the payout account and then your general manager goes in there with the payout account and sends it out to all the different people okay yeah i like it cool awesome. and there's yeah there's a lot of other good stuff. I mean, it's, yeah, this is definitely, I didn't know about the having and stuff like that. I just, I really thought of Bitcoin as being, you know, cause like somebody else said, I mean, I found, you know, I heard about it a long time ago and it's not the, the, uh, you know, the, you know, like the opportunity. Yeah. Good. Cool, man. Thank you. Glad you attended. Cheers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. Yeah. Tatiana, good to hear from you. Yeah, as well. So, Sam is here. Uh, so, anyone have any other questions before we wrap up this evening? Or you, maybe your morning? Yeah, for now. Yeah. Did you consider any of the other um, crypto uh, valuta, um, like Ethereum and yeah, Dotcom or you, whatever? I'll tell, you, I'll tell you right now some of the other ones I do hold. I don't, when I say 95% of my net worth is in Bitcoin, I actually, I should say crypto. Most of it is in Bitcoin. I think it's about 70% in Bitcoin. The other 30% is spread across some of the other ones. So I'll just go through and tell you right now. Some of them are even start actually. Ethereum. I hold Ethereum. I hold some BNB. The reason I hold BNB, I hold, I hold each for different reasons. I won't go into all the reasons I have right now, but there's a reason I hold the ones I hold. Um, BNB, though, is an exchange token. And so when Bitcoin starts pumping, like when the bull run starts, people are going to be using the Binance exchange like crazy that they've done in the past. And if you look at the Binance 
chart, it looks very different from almost any other crypto chart. And that it was nothing and it went up and it's basically stayed up the entire time. Every other coin's basically gone up and all the way back down. But Binance has stayed strong. And the more people that use Binance to trade, the higher the price of the Binance coin is going to go. XRP, many reasons to hold that. Uh, Solano, I do hold a lot of Solano. Thank God. I've made really, really good money with Solano recently. Past seven days, it's up like 8%. But the past like 30 days, it's up like 20%. So I've made really, really good money with Solano recently. Cardano. But you don't sell. You only buy. Yeah, right now, I, I'm buying right now, but I'm planning on these altcoins are probably going to go up much higher percentage wise than Bitcoin in the short term. So my goal is for them to go up or my not goal. My strategy is to wait for them to go up a lot, like moon, as they say, sell them at the top or close to the top. Or once I've got realized enough gains, I've already seen 20 percent gains on this, which is incredible. Once it goes up to enough where I'm satisfied. I will sell and then put that winning into Bitcoin. Because you consider Bitcoin the most stable one. Yeah, most long-term like, short value. Okay. The, the ultimate stable ones are USDC and USDT. Like these are called stable coins. Like look at the price. It's just constantly right there. So if you want stability, you put your stuff into USDT, USDC. But it's risky because... If you have your stuff in these coins, by the way, yeah, they're stable, but like government issued coins, they can freeze your coins on you. So, so that's a government issued coin, you're saying? No, not government issued. It, 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 government tra it traces the government price of the currency. Okay, because we have a whole different system in Denmark and everything is so controlled and regulated. So I'm just Googling some articles and it's like, oh, don't do that. People are doing it, obviously, yeah. still also here. Yeah, you don't necessarily want completely stable. That's like, you don't want that. You want something that's like long-term going to go up. So yeah. anyways, Cardano I hold. I hold a lot of Cardano. Dogecoin, I hold like freaking $200 of the Dogecoin. Just because every time Elon Musk... I call it Dogecoin. <laughs> yeah, Dogecoin. Um, Tron, I hold Tron. Many reasons to hold Tron. Uh, Tonecoin, I hold Tonecoin. Polygon, Polkadot. I do not hold any wrap Bitcoin. That's about, and Chainlink. I don't hold any of that. So Chainlink, I hold as well. That's it. Those are the other ones I hold. Um, nothing else. I don't know why these are start. But not Ethereum, which is the biggest yeah, of yeah, the. Yeah. I hold this one too. This, yeah, that's the first one I said. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. All the ones that are all the ones that are starred. I'll show you right here. Last one. All, anyone with a star on it, I hold. Okay, I get it now. So my and you're not interested in in like NFTs or like like art. I don't want to. I don't want to. Too much. Uh, no, I'm not into NFTs. I don't want to. Uh, put too much focus and attention on like buying and selling the stuff. I just want to buy it, okay. watch it moon, sell it, put it into Bitcoin and forget about it. The alt, the okay. alt coins are, um, for me, alt coins are very um, temporary. Anything other than Bitcoin is very temporary. I'm just doing them as a short term, boom, moving over to Bitcoin. Cause I don't want to watch the price all the freaking time. Okay. Yeah. Lots to take in. But it's taken me seven years to tell you what I just told you. So you've just condensed seven years of time into two hours of consumption. You might want to listen to all those other videos I sent you on the playlist. I'd love to get the the doc if if you yeah, wanna I, I put share it, in, it. I put it in the chat. Great, thank you. Yeah. Julia, two questions. Go for it. Ask away. Um, yeah, so the first question I have is about my email sequence. I'm currently working on the 52-week email sequence. And I was wondering 
uh, what kind of CTA should be the main one? So in the one that the template that Yelena sent, it's either uh, invite to the Facebook group or booking a discovery call, but which one should be like the dominant one, would you say? I would alternate. I'd alternate between those two. Those two are beautiful. P.S. P.S. If you haven't already joined the group, blah, 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 blah. P.S. If you'd like help speeding up your process to get these results, book a call. Mm -hmm. Alternate. Okay. But like 50-50 or would you think, say one is more important than the other? Okay. And then the other question is about the Facebook group. So first of all, I was wondering how you always upload videos to your Facebook community because inside the community, I can only upload videos up to 100 megabytes, which is not enough for a 10 minute long video. So how do you do that? I've never had an issue with size. I have uploaded two hour long workshops to Facebook. Um, if your file size is too big, then Google how to reduce a file size. You might be able to reduce it without losing the quality. I know there's an app I used to use. What was it called? It was so good. Um, video file size reducer. It was so good and it was so easy to use. Mm -hmm. And it didn't affect the quality at all. Like you couldn't, you couldn't tell. Um, but that means you don't have that limit or you didn't have that limit in the past of how many megabytes? It's called handbrake, get handbrake. Okay, mm -hmm. I'll check that out. But did you never have problems with the limit? No. Facebook, okay. Facebook behaves differently in different countries and different users. Mm -hmm. and it's, not, it's, not a, it's not the same across the board, but get handbrake, it's great. Okay, yeah, I will. And then actually one more about the Facebook group. So now that I've started being more active on Facebook, I'm also getting like a lot of friends requests. And would you just blindly accept all of them or filter them out or um, only accept friends requests from people who also join your community? You're at a point now where you could probably just accept them all. But the thing is, I've done that and then I just got so many messages from people who aren't even interested in buying my program, like, I don't know, some men or like just, <laughs> you know, people without a profile picture where you're not even thinking if that's actually real people. So, yeah, it's up to you. It, it, it's like, um, it comes down to like, how desperate are you? Right? Like, yeah, I'm not desperate. Like, not, if you're I, not desperate, then, then, then bring up the wall, bring up the barrier. Okay. So just accept like people with a picture and mutual friends, or if they joined my community. I've set it so that nobody can send me a friend request on Facebook unless we have five mutual friends in common. Ah, that's a great set, idea. You would set that parameter. Yeah, I would definitely do that. That's a good idea. Cool. Yeah, that was my question. Thank you so much, Ted. And thanks for the workshop. It was very nice. Yeah, cool. Cheers. Thanks, Julia. All right. Uh, Tatiana, Ted, I hope you have started using AI like we talked about. Uh, yeah, I think I'm slacking on that. You should host an AI workshop, though, Ryan. If you want to host an AI workshop for contemporaries, let me know. I will put something on the calendar for you, Ryan, and you can teach our contemporaries how to use the top three AI apps that you recommend help them become better, more efficient, more productive, more profitable content printers. Let me know if you want to host something. Cool. Yeah, he, uh, yeah Ted, um, Ryan actually attended three days workshop in Miami about how to incorporate AI in his business. So he's really into it. It's like, wow, he's so right. excited about it. <laughs> yeah, he's actually using AI voice for his um, for answering the phone. Yeah, in the class. I, I, I hope the audio quality isn't as bad as when he spoke earlier. Mm. What's that? I said I hope the audio quality isn't as bad as it was. Oh yeah, the the audio. No, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, yeah, if you want to host a workshop, at PM, we'll put something together. I've got to run now. Thank you all for the Thank you. time. Thank you. Share. And uh, 
Go get some Bitcoin, not financial advice. Ciao. Peace. Bye. Thank you. Cheers.